Hello and welcome to a bonus edition of the KL on Ice Rugby podcast on what has been a week of weeks and it's only Tuesday. Yesterday, Leinster confirmed the signing of all black Jordy Barrett on a short-term deal from December 2024 through to the end of the 24-25 season and it's fair to say it's not gone down swimmingly, myself amongst them. I'm not flying solo tonight despite this being a bonus podcast because I'm happily joined once again this week by Leinster fan Keenan Miller. Keen. Welcome back. It's it's been a, it feels like a long time since we've spoken, even though it's only been you know forty eight hours. Forty eight hours is a long time in the constant uh, news cycle we live in now. Um, and uh, yeah, what a forty eight hours it's been. He has, you know, like the 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 big news is obviously you know the likes of Osmanoni going to Bath or you know some contract extensions or some players who did or didn't get cited, but. We we like to focus on the niche things, you know, the things that no one's talking about here, and that's that's what it's about. But to be fair, Keith, like the fact that you're on means I have to start with your own personal excitement because it's the yeah. only way to do it. And like, listen, Jordy Bard is a fine player. He's we were just saying before we started recording, he's probably top ten in the world in in centers. Like, there must be a huge excitement for you on a personal level, and and for Leinster fans in general. Once the shit housing is parked to one side. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's it. Once you put the shit, if you look at it on a purely kind of rugby player basis, what a signing. I mean, really, you know, seemingly out of nowhere. I mean, I'd heard rumors over the past two weeks or so, um, but honestly didn't take them seriously. Um, you know, you hear stuff like this and you're like, come on. Um, you know, so, so yeah, so six months sabbatical from New Zealand to Leinster. Um, it's significant it really is significant like you, you can't underline how significant a player like that is going to be to a Leinster back line you know he, he I mean you know he's a he is predominantly a centre but he covers literally he has covered everything literally from 10 to 15 um, and to to the level he does so um, for New Zealand at an international level is absolutely insane um, you know brings a flexibility um, that's really like you you, uh, you you won't find it in many players I'll put it that way. Um and uh yeah, I mean it's 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 an historical the significant signing for Leinster. It really is. It kind of feels like uh, you know, other notable historical ones like you know, it's your Brad Thorns, your Rocky Elsons um on the short term contracts. It feels an awful lot like that. And really excited to see not only what he can bring himself as a player, but uh, what he can do with uh, uh bringing on uh, some of the backs. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later because it is important to balance the fact that he's a fine player being brought in to win, to win silverware. He will also leave a bit of a cultural impact. And it, I suppose the one gag that I'm only after realizing now is, you know, whatever happened to that Crusaders, you know, Lincoln that you had, which after signing their, their arch rival's best player, is that a part of it? Is that like helping the Crusaders getting back on top by taking Jordy Barrett away from Super Rugby for a year? I don't know. I feel like Rob Petty's doing enough to um to hold Crusaders back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but I want to touch on the optics. And optics is usually a dirty word, but I think in this case it is true because earlier on in the season, when Leinster signed Orge Slayman, Caelan Doris was announced to step up to a central contract only days beforehand. And then, of course, Jerry Thorne is the one with, with the scoop and it breaks at 11 o'clock at night. It's all anyone's talking about. This time around... Dan Sheehan gets the central contract, which, to be fair, I think most of us have heard this months, if not weeks ago, that yeah. he was likely going to be stepping up, and deservedly. But then Jordy Barrett signs. And there is the question mark then from other provinces, that is, you already have all the central contracts. Like, what more can we do? Because now you're, like, taking a player of that, like Dan Sheehan off the books to sign Jordy Barrett. And the, the, the other side of that is, the more central contracts you have, the more you can boost other players' wages and keep them in the likes of the Ronan Kellers, the Jack Conans, the Jamie Osborne's, the Kieran Frawley's guys who might be looked at as well. Like, yes, it's good business if Leinster are one of maybe two teams in Ireland, but when there's four, that's when it starts to get a little shaky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just in terms of the op- 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 the optics of it, um, it's, it, announcing them within hours of each other, it does kind of, irretrievably link the two in people's minds um it, it really is i mean it's it's only natural to it's very hard not to um i kind of they probably were looking to just really control 
the the narrative and get a get a big impact from it because it's a big impact signing. Um, but you could only kind of boost it by having some fairly substantial news in regards to uh, one of the homegrown players in advance of it. Um, in terms of the NIQ slots, he's a one for one with Natai, really. Um, but in terms of the the monetaries, I'm not sure you can directly correlate uh Sheehan's uh central contract with uh the funding um for for for, for Jordy Barrett because we don't know actually where the funding is uh, is coming from. Uh, often with the with the marquee signings like this, the big ones, um, there is private money involved, and as you know. We will hear little to nothing about that. We might hear a whisper that it was, you know, this this rich person or that rich group of people um who have contributed something to it or not. Um so it's a bit murky. Well, the flip but... side of that then Keen is most Irish internationals that aren't on a central contract are probably being topped up on a player international interest contract, which Maybe Sheehan wouldn't have because it's two years since he signed a contract and two years ago his position was was murky to use your own word. Mm. But at the same time, like it's it's an element of well, he's one of the best players in the world. If Leinster were going to pay him, it was probably going to come from outside anyways. He was he was definitely going to get himself get paid, as they say yeah. in America, a lot of the time. So there's probably that. I suppose that's you know, try to balance it as what we're going to try and do here tonight because yes, there is probably private investment. But the reality is that Dan Sheehan, they're not paying a cent for him anymore, nope. which is the beauty of the Irish system. Um, and good on Dan Sheehan, genuinely one of the best players in the world. And it yeah. has freed up an opportunity yeah. to sign someone like Jordy Barrett. And listen, I, I, I like Charlie Nata. I think he's a good player, but it's a, it's a, it's a step up, I think it's hard to say. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to spin it any other way than than a big step, step up. And I think... Charlie told me to say that himself, you know, like I mean, you know, he's not he's not he's no fool. Like um it's yeah, uh yeah, no, it 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 does feel very similar to the kind of the, the Brad Thorne signing in 2012. Um that is just such a large uh step up in, in a player quality that uh, it could really have a, a like we said before, a massive impact um at Leinster. Um you know the NIQ stuff, it's 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 so hard to figure out exactly what's going on behind the scenes. Um same as the central contracts, actually. I mean they are the central contracts are very public because they're announced. I have I've also heard some people say it's like, no, yeah, the the, the, the provinces pay some of the have to pay some of the wages for the central contract. I've heard other people say they don't pay any of it. I think it's not that they pay any of it, but it's you know, it's not crystal clear to people exactly what they represent, and people seem to have attached an importance to the central contract itself. Whereas, actually, it's just kind of like a a monetary; it's a financial instrument. Um, and I and think there's a what... there's an element of that. Sorry, King, just to interrupt. Yeah. But there's an element of that that goes into like image rights and these small, yeah. minutiae contractual obligations that ties into mm-hmm. it. Like, if you go back to say Ireland's World Cup jersey launch and their Six Nations jersey launch, only one player in either of those wasn't centrally contracted. First, it was Ross Byrne. Second, it was Kieran Farley. So that's kind of how they do it. And that's probably how yeah. they, they tie into it. And that's where, if you were to overhaul the system, because there's loads of people going to be saying, does this system work? And it's a fair question, but the RFU probably have themselves in knots in some regards in that, in that way, because when you tie in so many different yeah. things, like, like something like image rights, it can mm. just, it can be so hard to work it back out then. And then it goes into the provinces and, you know, the provinces, they're not a provincial player when they're with Ireland. They're an Ireland player, essentially, and it goes into that. And, you know, like, I know everyone wants to be in those Vodafone ads. Like, I think this looked like a load of crack, but uh, I don't think they do either. You yeah. know, um, maybe Dan Sheehan. I think Dan Sheehan would sell. I think that's that's fair to say. Um, He's a handsome man. He, he is, but I, Shaquem... Aren't they all handsome men? There are no men. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, look, I mean, I would actually be the first to agree with you. I don't think the central contract system works. Um, that may come as some as a shock to some people here from a from a Lancet supporter. I actually think it's it's kind of fundamentally broken, unfortunately. Like it, it still does the main thing it was set up to do, which is to keep Irish players in Ireland, but the landscape was vastly different uh back when these were uh when these were were dreamed up. Um, 
they were never designed with a uh, distribution, a uh, financial distribution, an equal financial or, or a somewhat just financial distribution between the provinces. And that's where the issue lies now, is that because you have a concentration of players um, on the uh, for the Irish team in one province, that it has created a disparity between that province and the other provinces to a very notable degree. I mean, kind of conic aside to some extent, given that they are the, the least funded of the four provinces. But Ulster and Munster are absolutely losing out. And it's not fair. <laughs> That's the thing. And like, I made this point months ago at this stage that if we get to a situation where... um. If we get to a situation where, say, Joe McCarthy or Matt Hansen or Jack Crowley step up onto a central contract, we assume they're next. I, th- I think that's fair. To, it's fair to assume they're next. Then it's most likely Ian Henderson that steps off. If not, maybe Ty Byrne. Then Munster either stay on one or, you know, for instance, if it's Byrne for Crowley or it's a case where um, Henderson comes off one and McCarthy goes up, Leinster go to 10. Ulster go to zero and I'm sorry but like yeah. give me a player for free then oh yeah we'll let you sign Werner Koch who's a he's a good player and I'm sure the fans will love him but at the same time it, it just doesn't seem right and this that actually ties in brilliantly with the next point I want to get into because there are a few post-COVID and I think this is the, the bit I fundamentally disagree with a lot of people's arguments on is Munster signed these two players ages ago Dale Ende is name fair enough Post-COVID, there's been a lot more blocking of NIQ moves. Some of that is under 20s talent, undeniable. Academies have improved. I think that's fair. Less games to be played, so less smaller squads. Mm. And just the funding. Whereas Leinster have undeniably upgraded. And you can question the, the leap that going from Maloney to Sneeman would make or different things or from, as we said, maybe not Natai to Barrett. But this is where there's going to be kind of a bit of ire about it because yeah. this is a move for Leinster to win a Heineken Cup while other teams, and like this is where the optics kicks in again, they're trying to not be in the Challenge Cup knockouts. Yeah. And that's where it gets really hairy. Like even as a Munster fan, did not deserve to be in the round of 16 base in the pool, like Challenge Cup, fair enough. And like, that's where you're like, oh, this is a bit, you know. Yeah. I, I don't have the words, but like everyone, in, there'd be a lot of expletives for a lot of people, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it is. It, I can absolutely get that it's a very frustrating experience um, right now for a lot of people. Um, because, yeah, I, I can see myself. It's not, it's not an equitable system. Um, that you have some parts that are visible and public, and in the case of yesterday, extremely public, um, where the, the, the central contracts are conflated with um, really, really high quality signings um now i mean i could temper that slightly by saying these are the first kind of high profile signings really that leinster have had since 2012 but again doesn't really matter a huge amount in terms of optics and timing um and given everything else that's happening the the, we're coming back to basket case for ulster again really um i mean it looks like maybe they've turned a corner in terms of Management, but it's it's too soon, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's too it's too soon to tell. But you know, there's some bad decision making there as well. Like changing the pitch it was the wrong time to do that. And, that, and that's where my question would have been when we talked about say Dan McFarland being let go on the bonus spot here in this channel. We would have said, "What? Where's the IRFU stepping in?" Because ultimately, and this sounds really demeaning, and I do not mean to to put down on any employees at you know the different provinces but a ceo at a province is essentially an operating officer they're mm-hmm. you know they're a subsidiary by all realistically and it's the new sephora's and co that are i don't like to say both of them but you know you are answering to them a lot of the time and that's where like ulster's pitch if you knew they were, they were going to be in the red maybe don't sign off on that maybe don't sign off on signing um stephen kitts off for example and so on and that's where it just gets Murky. That's where the, the again. murky again, but that's where the the kind of disillusionment in some regards probably kicks in as well. Where it's like, well, this is just bad call after bad call, or so it seems to be. Yeah, well, I mean, this is it, and you know, 
successions of bad calls often go hand in hand with financial difficulties. And it's really unfortunate that Ulster are in that position at the moment. I'm not sure that you can, in actuality, look at uh, at, the, at the two signings that Leinster have made for next season and go, well, that money should have gone to X, Y, Z, because we don't know if that money was actually in the IRFU coffers to begin with. But we can look <laughs> at the money that is in the IRFU coffers and go, well maybe we need to do something a little bit different. Like maybe we need to make the ponies a little bit more public, maybe a little bit better funded. Maybe, you know, they should be weighted towards the clubs that have, or sorry, the provinces that have fewer central contracts. Try to even up the system a little bit and at least give some kind of um, something for for the players that are, you know, even going to training squads with, with the Irish team, even if they're not necessarily first team or, you know, even if they're holding tackle bags, like that 10K bump for that. Do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. some kind of um public, clear, transparent <laughs> system that shows... Transparency okay, well, is going to be the buzzword, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it yeah, really feels that way because even if you're looking at, like, France and France do things their own ways that cannot be directly implemented because of their structure. I understand that, but they have gone for a more transparent system and right down to French selections where you're not taking all of our players for six weeks to all tackle bags. That's not going to happen. And that's arguably fair enough, but like transparency is going to have to kick in somewhere in that regard. And even if it is, I think the player national interest program is a good example. I think putting if you put central contracts by two, for example, because it is a bit bloated in certain positions, like back row center, for instance, if you cut that down a bit and then there's a little bit more money to go into the player of national interest program system, yeah. and then that becomes known as opposed to, oh, well, if you see province plus IRFU, it's player of national interest, wink, wink. But sure, the vast majority of people don't know that. And as well as that, like... Did the players really care in that regard? They'd rather get the name recognition if it was the other way, I suppose. Call them all central contracts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what What does that mean? Literally nothing. It just means a contract. That's central. Like, I mean, honestly, uh, you, you don't have to associate all of the naming rights and, you know, advertising deals and sponsorships and everything with all of them. You could have a tiered system within it, but call them all central contracts. Announce them. Yeah. Absolutely. Have have young fellas going on to junior central contracts. Why not? Yeah, you could do that. You could look at um I, I know there's player fees and all that for playing international games, but you know, there's people who are in the business longer than we are or have connections with the English system or Welsh or French or South African system as well. And finding something that ultimately have an agreement between the provinces and the IRFU, not an IRFU principle is probably what you know, some people would like to see as well, but you know, we want to keep it pretty short and sweet. So I want to move on to something just on the financial side of things. Now, Jamie Heaslip's not someone that gets quoted in a lot of podcasts as much as we loved him as a player, but he did say at one stage, Leinster's status in the URC is essentially like financial doping. And whether you agree with that or not, you take nine centrally contracted players, estimate four to five million euro worth of salaries, because Again, those guys deserve to get paid. If the money is in Ireland, they deserve it. I'm not saying that. Jordy Barrett is probably on about half a mil. Even whether that's a per annum figure or a six months figure, I don't know, but give or take half a mil. And Argus name is going to be on around the same amount. There's going to be bonuses. It's going to be guys who are playing international rugby who are on good contracts or the Lexi Keen Healy is on Leinster's books. Big contract. You compare that to the Welsh regions. And this is where the juxtaposition is stark because their entire budget is four and a half million pounds yeah and it's it's starting to, it will call the integrity of the league into question very very soon which i think no one wants the irfu are chief stakeholder they don't want that yeah. either i don't think and like it's it's not you don't want to have this kind of bayern munich psg style team in the league even if leinster don't win it every year you don't want to see that kind of that massive ga- wage gap i suppose no, you don't. You don't want a monolithic team within any league. It's bad for the league. I mean, frankly, we kind of saw that already in the Pro Twelve, Pro Fourteen era. Um, 
Leinster were fairly dominant and and it wasn't good for the league. Um, it's a bit more equitable now. Um, with the with the South African teams in certainly, but uh, yeah, the 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 money thing is an issue. I'm not going to lie. You know, Leinster have advantages certainly. You know, enter the D word there. Um, <laughs> I, w- I wonder what that. I'd say don't think, but I should. Clarify the D word is not what people might be thinking. It is demographic. I, I hope to God they're thinking demographics. It's not that kind of show. Um, it's not past the water, said you. No, no. So, yes, there is some of the demographics, but a lot of it does kind of come then, does derive from the central contract situation that we're currently in. Um, we kind of covered that to some extent. Um, so, sorry, skip to me notes. Um, in terms of the URC, you know, it is a, a a league of union franchises, so it is the interests of the union that are represented within the league, each union, sorry, that are the shareholders. Now, currently, a union, it is in their interests to have as many of their players within their own country as possible. Absolutely, you know, it's fairly and straightforward. And in, in every idea. sport as well, yeah. it's it's across, it transcends, doesn't it? Um, so whereas with say the premiership, it's um the cap is there really to stop a horse race between the clubs. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Um, uh, because well, because the the stakeholder of the union is an incredibly different thing than you know a a, a rich club owner or a, a you know an investment bank that owns a club, whatever you're having yourself. You know what I mean? It's 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 uh there to represent the sport within the country and is answerable to the government as well. Um, so, financial something, I disagree with that term, frankly. Um, uh, it's it's, it's definitely overpowered of a term oh, yeah. because it's no, it not, is. it is still within their rules, it's still within their rights, I understand that's, that. Yeah, it's more of the kind of relative, you know, the relative budgets is just, yeah. it's not easy on the eye. Yeah, no, it's not. It absolutely isn't. And yeah, I I can foresee some kind of kind of regularization mechanism will be needed. But you're talking about across different countries, across different political unions of countries, and across different hemispheres, all with different currencies. That's going to be extremely difficult. And also oh, all different economies as well. Whereas the countries that have this in place already, it's it's a single country. Or, yeah. Yeah, actually, they're all single countries, really. France is a little bit different, again, than everyone else in the entire world because they're French. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, it's, it's it's a tough one. It is going to have to be broached. Um, but at the same time, like, for example, Wales is a great example. Yes, we're so much bigger than any of the Welsh teams, but the WRU have been chronically underfunding the regions forever. Um. It's so it's it's not and yes I know the regions aren't technically well dragons is owned by the WRU the rest of them are owned by independent bodies, um so it's not quite the same thing, but the WRU have been putting that money into the semi pro game instead and they're kind of reaping the benefits of, so it's 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 not Big Bad Ireland's fault for that on the whole that they are doing that they have much bigger kind of monolithic presence uh, within the league than, than everyone else, um. But it's not the the fault lies somewhere between. As with most things, it's somewhere in between. And yes, we are going to have to look at it. We are going to have to figure it out. There could well be a minimum, as well as a maximum, um, some kind of banding. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I've I've thought about this one, and I can't come up with any kind of a fix for this one. It's it's hard, and like there's there's you know as you say currencies, there's different unions, there's you know so many different things at stake and it's hard and like someone did say maybe an FFP type thing is, is the way forward the only thing with FFP is it's based on revenue and what would happen there is union back clubs or whatever would just find a way around it no more than like there are if you can very easily say that TV contracts are for the provinces very like you could even though it's not really the case people are tuning in to watch rugby they could just spin it that way and that's where it becomes again the, the water gets it gets murky again that's, to use that that's word. That's the watchword. That is the watchword. It's All that and transparency. Words. They're the two words. Yeah, you know. they're, they're they're the opposite sides of the coin. Uh, you know, you got when you got the obfuscation of well, reality. <laughs> really, it's probably what it boils down a lot down to a lot of the time. But you know, also kind of relative reality. Uh, you know, what what can be seen to be truth. Um, or true in a 
from a particular point of view at a particular point in time and then just trying to let people know what's actually happening and try to make something that's you know fair again it's a difficult world but equitable for all the parties involved i agree i do agree Keena, I'm going to leave you one last point because this is something that's come up. I've done a podcast on Ulster. We've done a podcast post Six Nations. We've talked about the women's game. Um, this is all just in in two months. It has been it's been busy, man. It's been yeah. very busy. David Newsfora is finishing up at the end of the season, and for many people, he is kind of the stick to beat the IRF wins. You know, he's the one who's front and center. He has. Shane Rossed himself into those photos and that kind of you know that that ties into your reputation what's your thoughts on, on David Nusfora and like I, I don't expect you to come out here and say he's awful but I assume you'd be along the same lines myself where he's probably ran his course and what happened with the women's game should probably have led to a change anyways and and so forth so what way would you see it as as we approach the David Humphreys era which I've been informed don't know how true it is that David Humphreys is essentially already started working alongside David News for at the very least. The two Davids is going to get very complicated for the next few weeks. But what's your thoughts on News for before we go? Yeah, uh, probably the most divisive figure in Irish rugby since Warren Gatland. Um, is probably the best way to sum him up for me. Um, he has not made any friends, really. I think <laughs> is the other way to say it. He seems to operate on the basis that if you can't make everyone happy in a negotiation, make everyone unhappy instead, and that's fair too. Um, you know, sounds like first world problems. He has caused plenty of heartache to to Leinster fans from our point of view over the years. Um, I'm not going to go listing them out, but uh, things like you know the um losing Anger and Salano within four days of each other, uh, that seemed mental to us at the time and really screwed with our um progression uh for our younger for our younger players like our, our our chart was gone it's two from one position is gutting on, on a permanent basis like that um uh you know i'd blame matt o'connor on him as well if i could uh but yeah it's probably not his you fault. can you absolutely oh, can right. this okay stage. yeah yeah that matt o'connor that's his fault too and uh yeah he kicked my dog once um <laughs> He stole a couple of your chips, apparently, or something. <laughs> yeah, he did. And then he told me that he'd had his fun and that was all that mattered. No, <laughs> by all accounts, a, a kind of a fairly odd man, very withdrawn, didn't look to integrate himself into even kind of the social circles within the IRFU, from what I understand. Um, definitely did not come here to make any friends. And uh, I think on, on, on that, to that extent, mission successful. But... For all that said, some of the stuff worked. Yeah. Like Irish rugby is in a better position now than it ever was. You can't say none of that was down to him. At least some of it was. Um yeah. the Sevens as a pet project is actually kind of bearing some fruit now to some extent. Like mm -hmm. we're, we're we've got two teams going to the Olympics. It's not a not the worst return. Women's rugby is where he really, really, really dropped the women's fifteens. Um, to have catapulted that, um, to fund to, to keep the sevens funded, um, really is going to be probably my lasting memory of David Nusifora. I think that's fair, and I think that's something that whether you're a Leinster fan, Munster fan, Connacht fan, uh, Ulster, AIL, club rugby, whatever it is, or women's rugby, that's probably the one that you should look at because ultimately. Winning Six Nations with what arguably our best ever team, it feels good. But like, if the if the <laughs> the women's won Six Nations next year, it would feel twice as good because ultimately, like England are one of the best teams to ever play. You know the current Red Roses team. And that's kind of where it ties in. And you did mention the Olympics. That's great, but there is a kind of sense of lack of transparency around sevens, which I I anything I've ever asked or, or looked into, it, lack of transparency kicks in. Will the problems be, be very happy with him? Probably not. Will Jack Nienabar be pretty happy with him? Yes, because Jack Nienabar, in his three years in Ireland, has signed some incredible, incredible players. But you'll never please everyone. And that's the, also the side of it. That is the part of the gig. You know, there's four teams. It's not one. It's not two. 
but like four teams is is still not the easiest balance in that either when they bring in their own different levels of revenue and outside back and and so forth. But maybe we look on and say that he led a good groundwork and David Humphreys kicks on. Maybe David Humphreys never reaches the same level. Who knows? Only time will tell. But Keen, thank you very much for joining us this evening, for joining myself. To everyone at home, if you did listen, if, if you made it this far, thank you. It's It's been enjoyable and it's always good to get these bonus pods. The The elephant in the room, I don't know if Keen knows this, but I'm going to drop this on him, is that apparently within about 20 minutes of us finishing our recording, the Tyler Blaindell is expected to be um said to be Leinster's new attack coach, which as a Munster fan, anyone I've spoken to, he's held in the same regard as Felix Jones. So that's kind of scary. That's one of the reasons why when it was announced that my cat was leaving, he's someone I would have looked at, um, someone who knows the Irish system. So it looks to be a great signing. I definitely have no qualms about that. Scared, but but no issues with it. <laughs> yeah. But again, Keen, thank you very much for joining me. And to everyone at home, thanks for tuning in. You can catch me on the Red Army podcast, and we'll be back with Champions Cup semi-final coverage in a couple of weeks' time. Leinster against Northampton in Crow Park. Who can forget it? Um, but until next time, thank you so, so much. And until next time, take it easy. Bye-bye.